I want you to remember this 52-year-old male patient with difficulty breathing. He speaks in one to two word sentences. Room air saturation, SpO2, 90%. Respiratory rate of 26. You find this patient, what should you do next? I want you to remember this man here, because by the end of this video, you're gonna know exactly what to do. Now with oxygen, there's two things I need you to remember. Number one, not every patient gets oxygen. So just because someone has difficulty breathing, doesn't mean that giving oxygen is the answer. Now, what do I mean by that? Here's what I mean. The SpO2, the pulse oximetry, that little probe that you're gonna place in the patient's finger, that is going to measure how well oxygen is binding with the red blood cells. We get a percentage back on that, and our goal is to get 94 to 99%. Now, why is that? Reasoning is, if you have a normal patient who is completely healthy, has no diseases and no emergencies, and doesn't smoke, the odds are their SpO2 is gonna be in an adult 98, 99%. This mnemonic is coming to us from John Belinsky, who's a practicing physician assistant. Now, it's RR OWL. This is how you can very quickly assess a respiratory patient. So think of a pirate mm -hmm. owl, like R, mm -hmm. like a pirate, right? So RR OWL, that's the mnemonic from John. Now, here it is. Help me a lot, I hope it helps you. RR, the RR is respiratory rate. So what's the respiratory rate of the patient? O is for oxygen. What is the patient's SpO2? Bonus alert, I got a bonus tip for you and here it is on pulse oximetry. If you have a patient with COPD or chronic lung disease, you wanna ask them and their family, what's the normal SpO2 for them and titrate your oxygen to that level? 94% might be good for somebody with COPD. So we wanna get them back to normal, not blast them up to 99, they're not used to being there, right? Get them back to their normal. Everybody else who's having an emergency but they're not COPD or chronic lung disease, get them back to 94, 99, as high up as we can, okay? Now, words per cent. Words per cent is a patient speaking in full sentences, the best outcome, the worst outcome, they can't speak, all right? somewhere in between, like one to two, three word sentences. Labored signs. So do we see signs of respiratory distress? That's what we're looking for. So respiratory distress signs would be retractions in between, in between the ribs. Could be accessory muscle use, pulling in the neck, right? That, those are two I always think of. Positioning. If someone, let's say, is in a tripod position, right? If I'm bolt upright, if I'm in a tripod position, right? If I, my head is up like they're trying to get more, more of a breath, look for these positionings as well for signs of respiratory distress and don't forget the skin too. So now we're gonna use the pyroidal mnemonic to break down when we use nasal cannula, now our breather, BVM, so on and so forth. So let's talk about this first. So who needs a nasal cannula? This would be a perfect patient for nasal cannula. So here is what we do and how we use this mnemonic. One, we use a mnemonic around the field to assess patients, but what about on exams and quizzes? On exams and quizzes, when you have a scenario, I want you to look at the rate, look at the SpO2, look at what it's saying about the patient condition, use the mnemonic, and then match that up with what to do next. Remember that question in the beginning of this? Yeah, uh -huh. now you're gonna know what to do, okay? So RR, 22 is respiratory rate. Now, these are all gonna be in adult patients. So 12 to 20 is normal, so we're a little high. Could this be 24? Sure, could be 24 too. SpO2, 92, okay? In that range, could it be 93, 92? Sure, okay? Words. Speaking full senses, maybe some, some you see some mild, some mild symptoms, right? So we're talking about labor. I put zero, but maybe you're seeing some, some mild symptoms, but you're not seeing full on accessory muscle use. You're not seeing retractions. You're not tripoding. So this patient typically, let's say, is sitting on the sidewalk, sitting on the couch. Maybe they're even ambulatory. Maybe they're even like, you meet them and they're like, they're standing up, right? But when you go to assess them, here's what you find, right? This would be a great person to start with nasal cannula on. See the nasal cannula and get them back above 94 into that place. And then of course, there's more to do with this patient, but this is the oxygen step. So now let's look at the non-rebreather mask. 
Obviously, it's going to deliver more oxygen, about 10 to 15 liters per minute to the patient. Now, this is in, again, step up a more severe case. So with these patients in this presentation, we're seeing the respiratory rate increase, let's say 26 plus. So we have some rapid breathing going on. Now, what else do we look at here? Well, we look at 90%, right? So 90% as the SpO2, could it be lower in the 80s? Sure. The biggest thing when we're talking about delivering now a breather, is you have a patient, they're showing signs of respiratory distress, but they're still able to manage their own airway and they're still able to speak, they're still conscious. That's who needs an hour breather because the SpO2 is so low. And we can see the respiratory rate is, is pretty high, right? So this would be an example of a patient who would use an hour breather. Now with a BVM, your patient is unresponsive. They're unable to speak. They cannot manage their own airway. Now after BVM, I'm gonna show you something that can help you when people are in that gray area between non breather and BVM and how we can help them. So we'll talk about that in a second. Now look at this, BVM, bag valve mask, about 15 liters per minute, okay? So respiratory rate in this patient, let's say is six, eight, okay? Low side, right? They're unable to get enough ventilations to sustain their life. They need assisting with their ventilations, getting air in and out. This is gonna be low SpO2. They're not gonna be able to speak because they can't manage their own airway and they're gonna be unresponsive, right? So would we say this patient that needs BVM is in respiratory failure? Yes, we would say that. CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure. It's gonna increase the pressure going down into the patient's lungs. So here's what's gonna happen. The alveoli all the way down at the base, the bottom of the lungs is where our oxygen is going to enter the body. So for a lot of patients, let's say for example, they're having heart failure and there's fluid in that alveoli. Oxygen's having a hard time getting into the body, right? The gas exchange is poor. So with CPAP, it's gonna push pressure down and open up those collapsing alveoli and push the oxygen over to actually get into the body. And then also at the same time, get that excess fluid off to go back into circulation, and get it out of the lungs. So the primary thing we think about is a patient with pulmonary edema, which is pulmonary, the lungs, edema. I got fluid in my lungs, shouldn't be there. That's CPAP, okay? And also it can be used for COPD patients and asthma patients to better open up the lungs, okay? Now, let's say we tried a non breather, but we have poor results. I'm gonna show you in the next little slide here when CPAP should be started. But think about that. Maybe you try an hour breather at, for the, at first and damn, we're not getting the SpO2 where we need to be. The patient's probably a candidate for CPAP, but there's a few things we gotta look for. Now with CPAP, your patient has to be awake, they have to be conscious, and they have to be able to obey some commands. There's some coaching when we're talking about putting the CPAP mask on. It's a lot of pressure being put down in the lungs. It will take the patient a few seconds, maybe a few minutes, to get really comfortable with it, and then you'll notice I'm uh, relaxing and getting more comfortable, and ah, uh, the saturation's coming up. It's a beautiful device. Now, here are some things to remember. They need to actually be in respiratory distress. So like I said, we go back to that patient before that had a high respiratory rate, a low SpO2, right? It was like 90. The respiratory rate was like 26, right? High respiratory rate speaking in one or two word sentences. Let's say they were tripoding, right? Signs of distress, like accessory muscle use, right? Retractions. This is our patient. So a patient who's awake and can obey commands, who's in respiratory distress, with an elevated respiratory rate and a low SpO2, they're the candidate for CPAP. You wanna watch out for hypotension with CPAP. Now here's why. We're increasing the pressure going down in the patient's lungs AKA we're putting more pressure in the patient's chest. This pressure goes against what the body is used to. So what can happen is the amount of blood being returned to the heart, because there's so much pressure going on in the chest, at higher levels of CPAP, you'll usually see this happen, right? At a higher dose, just watch out for hypotension. So if somebody's already hypotensive and you wanna give them a high level of CPAP, 
we got to weigh that out, right? Because it can become more hypotensive. So that's something that, that could be a contraindication, right? So follow your protocols on that. With CPAP, you need to have plenty of oxygen because CPAP's gonna use a ton of it. So before shift, kind of make sure you have plenty of oxygen in the main O2. And quick tip for you, when you bring somebody in to the ambulance and you gotta move to the spare oxygen, so make sure that spare oxygen has some oxygen in it. Bring a second cylinder with you and just stick it on the back of the stretcher because what if you're in triage and it's all backed up and then you run out of oxygen in the middle of triage. So put in a, a bottle there just in case the handover is, can sometimes be time consuming. And what if they're vomiting? So let's say you have a patient, you wanna give CPAP, but they're vomiting. Well, if they're vomiting, we're gonna push pressure and they're gonna aspirate and then vomit. So we got to deal with the vomiting first. So what can you do? Well, Zofran is a medication that we give in the ambulance. So consider giving Zofran to treat the vomiting and then coaching them with CPAP. Hope it works for you. What exactly is PEEP? PEEP is positive and excitatory pressure. Remember earlier I talked about how CPAP is going to put positive pressure down into the lungs and it's going to open up the alveoli. So if your alveoli has fluid or it's collapsing, it's gonna open it up and keep it open. That's PEEP. That's what we measure right here when we give CPAP. How much PEEP are we gonna give this patient? So this is PEEP right here. If you hear anything about it, test question in class, there it is. So now that we've learned, we go back to our patient, 52 year old male patient, speaks in one of two word sentences. Wait a second, RR owl, respiratory rate is 26. SpO2, 90%. Words per sentence, one of two. Difficulty breathing, well, uh, that counts as labored, I guess. Sure. What do we do? We just learned this. Now a breather mask. What could we do later on? CPAP. So here's how a lot of the national registry questions work. It's always the next step. What's the next best step that we do with the patient? You should. Well, in this question right here, I have not gotten any other vital sign besides SpO2. I also don't have lung sounds. I also don't have a patient history. I just have this. So based upon this, all I've done is walk up and put a SpO2 on the patient's finger. Right. So with this information, B is the correct answer. Now, let's say, now let's go off into, let's say a different question. And let's say this patient here they tried an hour breather, but this is what the patient's on and they're currently on an hour breather. What do you do, right? If the patient is speaking in one or two word sentences, that means they're awake. Then we'd go, most likely would be CPAP. Remember, we learned BVM and nasal cannula earlier, right? BVM would be if they're unresponsive. If they're speaking, if you're able to speak, then you're able to control your own airway, you're still able to speak, right? You're alert enough. Nasal cannula is for mild symptoms, right? This is not mild symptoms. So now we know how to answer these respiratory questions. If you want to learn even more, the first link in the description down below is what I give to all of my students, whether you're getting ready for school, in school right now, or getting ready for your national registry or state exam. First link down below is lifetime access, videos, quizzes, and access to me to answer your questions. Hit that link there and I will see you in the next video. There's a video right now coming on the screen. Go watch that, you're gonna love it.